Well, hello and welcome to the Astrology Hub podcast. This is our flagship show dedicated to sharing the multitude of astrological approaches and perspectives. We feature up and coming astrologers as well as living legends in the field and connect you with experts and thought leaders in fields related to astrology, demonstrating how astrology can support you in so many areas of life. My name is Amanda Poole Walsh. I'm the founder of Astrology Hub and the host of this show. And I am so thrilled, honored, excited, so many things to be introducing you to one of the country's foremost psychic and mediums, John Edward. He was the star of the hit shows Crossing Over and Cross Country. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's been featured on The Oprah Show, Dr. Oz, Ellen Larry King Live, and many, many more. He was named in People Magazine as one of the most intriguing people of the year in 2002. He's the creator of the Evolve membership, and he's also a lover and student of astrology, a fan of Astrology Hub, and a new and amazing presence in my life. John, thank you so much for being here today. It's so wonderful to have you. Thank you for having me. It's it's kind of weird to be like not on the like elliptical machine listening to you. And <laughs> to you. I have to remind myself like, oh, okay, I'm on. I'm not just watching. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so great. So John, I'd love if we can start there. I, there's so, I have literally a billion questions for you, as I'm sure our audience does as well. So if you do have questions for John, please write them in as we're talking. But I would love to start with your, like how you came to us and how what what you what you were drawn to about astrology have. Because from my perspective, what happened was our beloved um, connection point, Rick Merlin Levine yep. said to and Ann Ortley. I mean, but she doesn't know she's a connection point. Nope. <laughs> But Rick Merlin Levine, um, I was talking to him. He said, you know, John Edward, he really likes what you're doing. He's really wants to support what you're doing. Um, you two should have a conversation. It was like, oh my gosh, amazing. That's the coolest thing ever. So that's how you came into my life in 2020. And you're one of the blessings of 2020 for me. Seriously, it's been so much fun getting to know you and working with your team. Um, but John, tell from your perspective how you came into the Astrology Hub world. So, you know, I've been doing this work for 31, 32 years now, since 1985, so however, however many years that is. And I do a lot of traveling, like a lot of touring, right? I've been on a perpetual tour for th three decades. One night I was leaving one city and it's like one o'clock in the morning, my wife called me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what am I doing? I'm doing the same thing I was doing when you first met me. I said, I just left one event. I'm in my rental car and I'm driving across state lines to go to my next hotel to do it all again tomorrow. I go, not much has changed, right? Funny, funny, haha. -ha. But some of those long, some of those drives was where I would do podcasts because I don't want to listen to the radio and and I would get my astrology in and I would go to different places and and I'm I'm very discerning, Amanda, with what I will take into my vibration, like what I want to expose myself to. So, like for example, back in in the day when I was involved with yes, ballroom dancing, that's how I met my wife. I would I would not watch people who were bad dancers because I knew that if I watched it, I would absorb it. And then like maybe mimic it in some weird way being Libra. So I was like, mm, not going to do that. Um, so like I would, I would try to resonate with different people and I didn't like their approach. I didn't like they were coming from and because I work with energy. I didn't like their intentions. So I'm a big intentions person. So then I found Ann Ortley and I never met her. I never had a reading with her, but she's got this like New Yorker, you know, ballsy kind of energy. And, um, I resonate with that because she tells it like it is. And I, I remember listening to her at her Bright Red Desk podcast. And as she was talking about the potential pandemic that was coming. Now, my background comes out of public health and, you know, I did the whole epidemiology stuff and healthcare administration. So that's like my my behind the scene worlds. So the way she talks about coming out of corporate Pepsi, I come out of corporate healthcare. So one of the things for me was watching you know, her talk about what was coming up astrologically with the pandemic that nobody seemed to be that concerned about. And I was flipping out over. And when, when she talked about like food rationing and she talked about how this was going to be a global thing, I remember driving in the car going like, yes, yes. Why isn't everybody else like reacting like this? And I want to say it was February that she talked about that. And then, um, I went to look for, I was off the road. We were now in lockdown and I went to go look for her podcast and I, I couldn't find it. I don't know. It was almost like it was like hidden for me. And I was like, well, let me try YouTubing it. 
So when I YouTube, she came up, but it came up as Astrology Hub. So I thought, oh, she just rebranded what she's doing and she's doing it on YouTube. And then I started watching and I thought it was her show and like you were helping to like, you know, administer it. And then I was like, wait a minute. No, this woman's doing more than that. And then I started like digging around. And like I said, I'm big on intention and I felt your intention with what you're trying to do. And, you know, I come out of the psychic fair world from being a kid. And one of the things that I think that this subject matter, whether it be psychic, astrology, numerology, it attracts people that are insecure and somewhat looking, you know, they're to bolster their ego in some way. And they make these huge leaps. Like they might like read a book on psychic development and then start doing readings. They might read a book on tarot and then start doing readings. They might take a basic class on astrology and then they hang out a shingle, you know, and I, I call those Joe psychics. So whenever a Joe psychic would come and sit in front of me, I would know in like two seconds, I'd be like, yeah, this is a Joe psychic, you know, like Snoopy's Joe cool. I used to call it Joe psychic. And I wasn't sure. Like when I first started watching, I was like, you know, like, is, is Amanda, does she want to be an astrologer? Does she? And then I was like, no, this woman has, no other agenda except bringing forth information to raise vibration. And I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. And the reason why I felt it was awesome is I attempted to do that with my first iteration online. Um, I did an online community called Infinite Quest and I literally had like, you know, 60 people from around the world and it was a huge undertaking and problem about being psychic was way too early. Um, like I saw the future of now and I tried to do it like 12 years ago. <laughs> Timing was completely off. But what I what I found that you were doing was that you were putting forth information to help people become empowered, help them evolve, raise their awareness. And you weren't certifying people to become like astrologers in six easy lessons. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't it, it wasn't like, you know, painting by numbers. It was going after the, you know, the, the heavy hitters in the field and bringing forth their information in a way that you became the medium. Because I think that sometimes and no, no disrespect to anybody in this field, but sometimes like when they go off in the astrological conversation of what things mean, if you have not dedicated yourself and I've been doing this for a long time and I still don't get it. Um, if you've not dedicated yourself to learning that language in that way, you could lose people and you anchor the conversation, bring it back, repeat, reiterate, hit those points. And it's like the journalistic approach. And that is what I resonated with. And that's oh. how I and that's that, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I wound up reconnecting with Rick and I was, you know, doing some, um, you know, like mentoring with Rick because I wanted to know like what was happening um, so I can use that in my client's sessions. And I said, you know, listen, I really like what you guys are doing. And then he and I did a Facebook Live to promote what you guys did with his first course. And here we are. And here we are. And and I've been so honored to be contributing this year to your Evolve membership, which we'll talk about at the end. But so that's it's been so fun because I get to come and bring really basic high level astrology to your members in a, in a, I think in a language that is easy for them to understand. And so that if they do want to come and learn more that they can do that. So yep. that's been such an honor and a different role for me, which has been really fun. And I thank um, you. It takes the pressure off of me from <laughs> having to do that. <laughs> it's like, it's like, Amanda. <laughs> I'm so happy to do it for you, John. Okay, so I know that you came into your career path. Mm -hmm. The first entry point from what I've read, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it was through a reading, which I know that tons of people in our community came to astrology first through a reading, myself included. You know, it was that first reading that was like, whoa, there is definitely something to this. So can you tell us about that experience, um, what happened and how that led you on the path you're on right now? So my mom's side of the family, way into the subject matter. They loved psychics, tarot readers, astrologers, seances. It was like their thing. My dad's side of the family, New York City police officer, career military guy, did not want me around the subject matter like at all. So from a very young age, I was kept away from it. Then my parents divorced at 12, 13 years old. I moved into my grandma's house with my mom. And at that period of time, you know, I was now developing my own sense of who I was as a person. And although I was not close to my dad, you know, I did a, I did apply some of what he would say to like what that side of the family did with the psychics. And I was the, um, I was the person who was making fun of everybody's readings when they would come out of the room. I was the person who was ripping apart everybody's reading, you know, and I would jokingly say stuff like, oh, wait, let me guess. Wait, 
he told you you're going to Florida. And you know, my husband would be like, yes. And I'm like, she, how did you know? I'm like, because you're in New York and everybody goes to Florida. New York. If he said you were going to Oklahoma, I would have been impressed. She's like, yeah, but I'm, I am going to Florida. I'm like, all right. Like, so I was that person. So I understand the skeptic, skeptical side of the approach because I, I, I did it. And I was really good at it. Like I was really good at pulling apart the readings and going, well, you said this and then she said that and you said this and they said that, which also helped me with how I read not to do those things, which I refer to as being lazy. Um, and then I went for this reading to at this one day to kind of prove my family that this woman, Lydia, would not be able to read for me. And she changed my life. She gave me information that there's no way possible that she could, she would not have, like, there's nothing that she, what she told me, I would have had to have been with her and confided in her. And then she would have had to talk to some of the other people. They would have had to confide into her. And then outcomes that were like ridiculous happened like within weeks. And it, it all got my attention and her opening line to me in the reading after she took my high school ring and performed something called psychometry and psychometry is where you hold on to an object and you read the energy of the object. And there's two different types of psychometry. There's objective psychometry where you could like hold on to an object and get the history, origin and the energy of what that object came in contact with. And then there's subjective psychometry where you could read the person who owns the object. And that's what she was doing. She didn't look at me. She just looked straight down holding my, my high school ring. And she started to tell me that I had highly evolved beings of white and gold light that were ready to work with me. And that she was there that day to change um, my path and put me on the path that I was supposed to be on. And I literally remember, she wasn't looking at me. I was like sitting there like, uh, slaves, you see? <laughs> She's like, you do? She was so um, commanding, maybe is the word. <clears throat> she was so, um, taking herself seriously, like that, like, I was like, all right. Like, I was like, okay, but that to me was like a big old strike one. And then she got involved with some other stuff that I thought made sense, but then I thought I could kind of apply that to, you know, any guy in high school. And then that last part that I told you about already, she just came out with stuff that this is just no way. So as a result of that, when those things happened, I kind of had a, uh, like the floor fell out for me a little bit, like, whoa, okay. How did this woman know this? And more importantly, I didn't go to the place of, oh, she told me I'm psychic and I'm going to change the way millions of people look at her field. None of that even hit me. What hit me was I felt violated. I felt like somebody robbed me, like somebody broke into my house and went through my stuff. And that is a creepy feeling. That wasn't like, oh my God, that was amazing. That was so cool. It felt like a violation. And I wanted to know like, okay, so let's say this woman can do this. Can other people do this? Like, can people do this without you knowing that they can do this? And like, whenever somebody has been robbed, that's usually when they put an alarm system in. And my quest began looking for understanding about what she did and how do I put that alarm system in? And it was in reading, you know, letting, literally sitting in the floor of the Glen Cove public library here in New York. Um, I would, I was embarrassed to check the books out because they were under the occult section and it just sounded you know, dark, you know, culty. And I was like, I'm not checking these books out. So I sat after high school every day and I read these books and I remember going like, this isn't psychic. This is common sense. Like everybody does this. It's like saying like, you know, Oh, breathe deeply. Well, everybody breathes, but do, but if you actually talk to somebody who does like opera singing or yoga, their way of breathing is different than everybody's way of breathing. So then I started to do this deep dive and that deep dive revealed that, okay, so I wasn't as normal as I thought I was. And I took things for granted, let me push the envelope. And I'm very clear on the fact that from the ages of like 15 to 19, my trajectory was ego. My trajectory was, let's see what I can do. Let's like, you know, let me, let me, let me shock you. Let me, um, let me predict this. Let me see what I can get. And it wasn't about talking to dead people. That didn't, I was doing this work for about two and a half years. And then connecting with spirit and the other side came in after that. Did that happen after age 19? Like after it was less ego based for you? Um, I will say that in 1987, my uncle died and I saw his passing before it happened. He was only 52 mm -hmm. and I saw it happen and I tried really, really hard to stop it. Um, and I couldn't get people to take me seriously. I mean, I was only doing this work for like, you know, 18 months, two years already. And I tried, but it didn't, it, it didn't happen. And I remember feeling like devastated, like, why would God give me this ability and see that? And then I can't stop it, you know? And I, and I'm, I'm not saying that like, I, I didn't lightly go, Hey, I think we should get your dad's like health checked. You know, 
like I literally said to like one of my cousins, I'm like, do you love your father? And she was like, yeah, I go, well, if you don't get him to a doctor or to a hospital, he's going to die. And that was in October of 1987. Um, and my mom was like, well, that was subtle. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't know what, how else to say it because like nobody was taking me seriously. And then he passed in December of 1987. And I just was like, whoa. And then um, a year and a half later, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And then after she passed, I got the second blow, you know, it was like the second woe. And that woe was very different because I didn't see anything connected to her, like zero. Like nobody gave me a heads up about her. Like nobody said, by the way, your mom has cancer. Um, your mom's going to have surgery. And I could tell you it was April of 1989. She was sitting out in the backyard of my grandma's house and she had a very, very bad shoulder pain. And, um, she waved me over. I was coming up the driveway and I walked to the back and I go, what's the matter? And she had her hands up in the air like this because it was alleviating the pain. And she said to me, um, ask your guides to tell you what's like wrong with me. Hmm. So I did. And I heard one word, pass. That's all I heard was pass. So I looked at her and I was like, whatever it is, it's going to pass. And she's like, why? I go, they just told me pass. I go, so it's going to pass. And I turned around and I started to go towards the house. And she said, oh my God, you're missing what they're telling you. And I'm like, what? She goes, they're telling you I'm going to pass. And I remember like looking at her like, why you gotta be so Italian dramatic? Like, why can't it, why, why you gotta try to interpret my symbols? I go, did you hear what they said? And she just like looked at me and she literally said, she goes, you're gonna be standing next to my casket and you're gonna remember this conversation. And sure enough, I did. Now, maybe that's what they were trying to tell me, but that was not a definitive message pass that's not I, I don't know how my brain works my brain works like i need a lot of validation you know like in front of me at all times i have this rock that says trust to make me trust what's actually you know coming through but that those two book ended events for me ended the you know the reign of ego so the the reign of ego for me was all about like exploring what i can do um and then the reality of her passing became like the gravity moment, you know, we're like, okay, this is not about anybody else and clients. This is not about what I can do. This is about me moving forward. And how do I move forward? Cause I'm not close to my dad. And how do I move forward without her? And how do I take care of my grandmother who's still here? Like it was, a, it was a lot at 19 to kind of like the, the, the again, the gravity of that was really huge, mm. but I wouldn't go back and change anything now, to be honest, like at 50, almost two, you know, I look back and go, if all of those events didn't happen exactly as they did, you and I would not be having this conversation. And that's a very weird place to come to because you know everybody explores the time travel trope on TV and movies. And we always think about if we can get into the, you know, the time machine and go back, you know, you know, who, who would kill Hitler or who would stop this or who would do that. But ultimately it comes back to what we would do in our own lives on our own timeline. And I, I came to the place I, I wouldn't change anything because if I did, then all of those people that Lydia Clark predicted I would shift and change and help would not have gotten the shift and change and help in the way that it came through for them. Mm, wow. Fascinating. John, did you ever get resolution to that question you had? The question of why would God give me this ability if I can't do anything about it? I, I, I have a, I, you know, did I get an answer? not in the way you're asking, do I have a hypothesis? I do. I think it was to teach me that it's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's not about any medium or psychic or astrologer. It's about the lessons. And this is a classroom and we're all here to learn. So some of the hardest experiences we have in our scholastic approach to school, you know, we remember those the most. You might remember your friends and the fun stuff in high school, but I guarantee you, if you think about high school, anybody that's watching this right now, you're going to remember your hard teachers. You remember the teachers that gave you a difficult time. You're going to remember those people who taught you the valuable, tough lessons. And that's what I think that those two things were for me. They were tough lessons. One I saw and couldn't stop. One I couldn't see and couldn't stop. It made it bigger, way bigger than me. And that was a very, it was the humbling for me. It was the moment of going like, okay, this is about what I'm allowed to see. This is about what I'm allowed to touch upon. And I took that into my practice with my clients where I would say to them, like, listen, there are things that you're going to want to know and have answers for. One of the big ones is if somebody was, you know, um, you know, if they passed under mysterious circumstances, those questions 
literally leave like um, an unraveled energy for people that they can't tie things up neatly with their grief. And it stops people sometimes. And it has been one of those, those moments in, in readings where I have to say to people, they don't want to talk about their passing because if they talk about their passing, it anchors you to the moment of their passing rather than the continued connection of their energy in your life today. God, John, that's so incredible. I've been thinking about that so much. I don't know why, but how when someone passes, we 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 reiterate how they died. We ask how they died. We we want to know how they died versus the focus or emphasis on how they lived and what they left you with and and who they were for you when you were alive, when they were alive. It's it's yep. such an interesting thing. And that's fascinating to hear it validated from the other side too. Like we don't want that to be the thing you remember. We don't want that to be the thing that you focus on. Yeah. And even with like, I've had a, a couple of experiences. This one's more about me and let's say the other side experiences. Um, very young, I was doing a psychic fair. And during the course of a uh, presentation at the fair, like doing like a little bit of a lecture, I wanted to make a connection um, with a woman and got a little bit of information about her niece being missing. That's it. That woman then came to me for a private reading. And during the, during the actual reading, her niece came through and her niece was giving me information that kind of pointed at who did it, like who killed her. So I'm getting all this information. And as I'm describing it, it actually fit this girl's boyfriend. Um, the type of car, his look, his build, where they lived, like all of this stuff was very, very specific and pointed without me going, aha, but it kind of did go aha, and, you know, like but indirectly that the boyfriend did it. And I kept getting the name Michael. And the woman that I was reading had a son who had passed whose name was Michael. And she, she kind of like commandeered the reading. And I wasn't me now then. Um, and she said, Oh my God, that's my son, Michael. And he's definitely going to be with her cousin, with his cousin. And he's taking care of it. And she got like a little emotional and she kind of like took the, she took the, imprint. and I remember the moment of going, I don't think that's it. Well, when it got revealed that her neighbor, Michael was the one who actually perpetrated the crime and it wasn't the boyfriend, but they drove like a similar car. They lived next door to each other. Like all of these overlapping things. I then went to the place of, I don't want to do that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to. So I could have somebody legitimately try really, really hard to be like, you know, Joe did it. You know, Kathy did it. And I'm going to be like, la, 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 la. I just, I, I won't get it because I don't want the responsibility like that. And I think that we have free will in the sense that we can say, no, 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 I don't want that kind of information. And I think we all have a team of energies and that team can kind of like say, sorry, security, you can't, you can't bring that message in. You can't. Mm -hmm. And smuggle that message in. It's not going to be something he's going to want. He's not going to give it. It's so interesting because it's with astrology too. With great power comes great responsibility. And so sometimes you can see things in a chart or you can see a proclivity. Or, and it's like, there's always this question, how much do you share? How, right. do, how blatant are you? You know. So fascinating to hear about your experience with that. Let's turn to astrology a little bit. Sure. Do you mind sharing your sun, moon, and rising? My son is a Libra. Um, Actually, my biological son is also a Libra, but my my son is <laughs> a Libra too. A Libra, Scorpio rising, and a um, Aquarian moon. Nice. Okay. Now let's talk about astrology. Why are you drawn to it? Do you use it in your practice? Just tell us a little bit about your experience with astrology. So, as a baby medium, when I first started doing this and started working at the psychic fairs, and I met a woman whose name is Shelly Peck. And Shelly was my mom's age, but she and I became best friends. And when I say we became best friends, we became best friends. So it would be odd that she had kids that were slightly older than me. And I would call, you know, every day and it'd be like, can I talk to your mom? Um, <laughs> like, you know, we, we just had a really good connection. And she was a, you know, you say jack of all trades, master of none. She was a jack of all trades, master of all. She was a amazing psychic, a ridiculous medium. Her astrology was off the hook. Past life regressionist. I mean, this lady did the work. Um, and she would look at my chart and be like, you need to let me teach astrology. And I was in college at that time. And and I, <laughs> and she was like, just, I, you know, I've got a class starting on, you know, Thursday night. I've seen your chart. You need to be in this class. I need to train you. And I was like, okay. So I went. So we got to figure now, if I graduated high school in 1987, this is probably 1988-ish around there. 
there were no computer programs like you know doing your charts or whatever. You had to actually cast a chart back then. So she hands me like seven books, and I like looked at her and I was like, "What do you? What am I doing with these?" And she's like, "Well, I'm going to teach you how to you know cast a chart." And I was like, what do you think? I'm sailing across the Atlantic like Magellan. I'm like, at latitudes and longitudes. I go, are you out of your mind? I'm taking 18 credits this semester. I go, I got 21 credits in the next semester. I go, I can't do this. And she literally was like, you have to let me teach you. And that was my journey. Like she, she, she tried so hard. I mean, she would, she would like, she would teach me indirectly, but um, it, 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 I wound up having a problem. And I think I figured out why I failed geometry technically twice, but say once. Um, really, really bad teacher. We had a teacher in school that had Alzheimer's and they like literally let him sail through his last year. And he was not a teacher. He just like sat there, read the paper. And I'm the kind of person I need to be taught. You need to show me, you need to come up with analogy. Like Rick could not be a better words, explanations, analogies, you know what I'm saying? Stories, adding color, like he fits in my brain. Um, and fits in my brain, but this guy geometry wise did not fit in my brain. And, and I think because astrology is referred to as sacred geometry and because I had such a mental block with geometry, boom, I, 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 I it couldn't get in. So I know more than I, than I, than I think I know. I know a lot, but not enough where I would say I could look at somebody's chart and read it. But then when I look at somebody's chart, I actually get psychic information. So I kind of feel like it becomes a tool like a tarot card in some way. Um, but yeah, that was my, that was my, my, my journey into like learning about it was the film and Shelly pack. And then I tried like, you know, five, six different teachers and approaches. And um, it's just, I, I don't think I'm supposed to know astrology to do it. I feel like I'm supposed to know enough about it that it adds to what I do. Cause otherwise I think my OCD analytical logical brain would only look at things through an astrological lens, which would then stop me from being able to open up to what I have to do when I'm reading. Mm. How does it add to what you do? Personalities of the people. Um, if I'm making a connection with somebody who, uh, you know, has a certain kind of a feeling to them by like, by like, by sign. Um, and I, 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 I can get a feeling or flavor of their personality by what I'm seeing sometimes with dates and timing. Um, if I know that I'm reading a client and I see that they are going to go through a huge life change where it feels like a tsunami is about ready to hit them. And then I find out that they're like, you know, let's say a Capricorn, right? This is a, a real, real story. Um, I, I would then be like, yeah, the next two and a half years for you, I think are going to be where these things are going to hit because you've got Saturn going through your sign. And, you know, you might want to have your chart done. So I kind of feel like I'm like a general practitioner who then goes, you need to see a specialist, right? <laughs> and like, go see the specialist. I always, my, all my analogies are healthcare based because of my background. So it's like, you know, you don't want the eye doctor doing heart surgery. You know, you send them to the cardiac surgeon. So I kind of feel like you want to go to the astrologer to, to do that. And that's what I do. I recommend people. And then sometimes depending upon um, who the client is, I know that I have to recommend a certain astrologer or a certain person. Otherwise the information is going to fall in deaf ears. Oh yes. I mean, it's not all, just like not all doctors would be all be the same. Not all astrologers are the same. When someone yeah. asks me, who should I have a reading with? It's like the biggest question you can ask me. It's I, 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 I ask a million questions to you and then recommend someone because it's a big deal who you choose. Yeah. And you know, and it really can fall on deaf ears. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, because it's the same thing with psychics and there's a, a medium who's in London um, a very gifted guy. His name is Robert Brown. And I've known him since probably 1996 when he first came over. And um, after he watched me work and we got to know each other a little bit early on, he said to me in the most lovely British accent, you know, you're not for everyone, right? <laughs> and I looked at him, I was like, what? He goes, some people need a softer hand when they're, when they're in, in, in a difficult spot. He goes, you're like a tank. <laughs> I'm like, Thank you. I think. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's the East Coast New York thing that I have always just totally loved as well. And that's why I appreciate Anne. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we are both in fields that have been totally ostracized by society for the last couple thousand years. 
how do you deal with that? At, you know, being sort of that outlaw outcast and how do you work with skeptics and criticism and things like that? So I kind of group them into two different categories. And every event that I do, I always imagine like right behind me to the right, I put a balcony and it's the balcony from the Muppet show. And I imagine legitimately the two old guys from the Muppets up in the balcony, you know, Walt Wolf and Statler. And then I call one skepticism and I call one cynicism. Mm. They're up in the balcony and they're presiding over anything metaphysical in, in the way I look at stuff. And they're, they're kind of like, you know, um, negating each other by their little bickering and talking, but they're kind of removed from the actual stage. So when you think about their placement, they're removed from the stage. They're not the focal point, but they serve a, they serve a purpose. So cynicism, I don't really have time for it. That's like, no matter what people see, they, it's never going to change their mind. Skepticism, I want everybody to have. And here's the reason why. If you look at the world we're currently living in, whether it be political or pandemic, right? The two Ps. If you look at those two Ps, oh my God. If people were a little bit more critical thinking, if they're a little bit more science-based, if they're a little bit more analytical, um, here in the States, at least, I know we would have been out of a pandemic probably by May, June last year, if there was some level of political plan pandemic type of plan, right? Where there was some type of an approach. Instead, there was like this like pinata moment of everybody can whack COVID-19 or whack politics in any way that they want. And facts didn't matter. And I was like, I have a I have a problem with that. So, um, in in the way of looking at skepticism, it's really basically say saying to someone, use it, question what you're experiencing, become an explorer. Because if you're an explorer, that leads to discovery. And then when you have that moment of discovery, that raises your awareness. Now, with that new awareness, your choice, but you could put that into action, and that action helps to evolve what you're, what you're currently doing. And I think that to me is helpful. So skepticism is helpful. Cynicism is a hindrance. And how do you, I mean, how has it been, how has it been navigating just, you know, people not even being open to, I think what I'm saying is being just totally on the outside of right. uh, what of the, of the realm of quote unquote norm, normalcy. I, I think because I was that person, and like I said, I was very good at ripping apart my family's readings when they would come out of the back room. You know, like I was that person who would get to the impasse and go, hmm, I don't know how they knew that, but they must have did it like this, or they must have got it from that person. You know what I'm saying? Like, I never went to the place of like, well, maybe they could do this, because I already made up my mind that it wasn't possible. But yet I can't say that I was cynical. I was definitely skeptical. But I think that that skepticism helped me when people come at me. And I guess this might sound really arrogant. I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I don't care. Like, I just don't, I don't like, like I really honestly don't care. Like when somebody goes like, I don't, I don't believe I was in Durban, South Africa. And it was a beautiful theater. And this gentleman like, stand, I'm in the middle of doing a presentation, answering somebody's question. And this guy stands up and he goes, you need to prove it to me right now that you can do this. In front of a room full of people. And I like looked at him and I was like, is your mom alive? And he looked at me and he went, yeah. I was like, well, then we need to call her because she failed you. Because that's rude and disrespectful. You think that your grief is more important than everybody else that's standing here? I go, sit your ass down. Like, I got no time for this. Like, that's my approach. Like, like you said, I'm doing something, right? So I think when we look at where someone's coming from too, I think we have to take into consideration. Sometimes people will come at, in my world, they'll come at the medium with an attitude and an anger, but it's not at the medium. It's at their, it's at the fact that they're, they're sitting in front of the medium or that they need to sit in front of the medium or whatever brought them to that place of having to explore, having to talk to their relative through a, through a medium, right? So that's a different, there's all these different like roads that bring us you know, to kind of come to the same place. But I think skepticism is helpful. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you know this, Amanda, but you are interviewing the biggest douche in the universe, according to South Park. So what? you don't get a full on episode of South Park unless you made a little bit of a difference <laughs> and a ripple out there in the universe. So um, yeah, I have a whole episode, yep. So, you know, a couple of times a week, there's a few kids that, you know, come across the episode and I get my little reminder, you know, and I, I laugh and I say, oh, that's the universe, keeping it real. 
But those same people who who would never know who I am because they they would have no reason to find out who I am, Google me, watch clips, see interviews. Somebody might even be watching this as a result of that that show. So I look at it as a universal boomerang because I feel like what we put out there comes back to us. And sometimes it's not a pleasant way, but those ways are a way that that person had to come in, right? So like I found you through Ann Ortley. I, I would probably not have Googled astrology because I would think I'm going to get like, you know, like, you know, 1-800 dial a psychic or something. Like I, I wouldn't have done that. I would go, I would Google a specific person. I would look for a specific astrologer, but I wouldn't do astrology. So I feel like I had to find you and come in through in. Mm, wow. Amazing. And it's like you're, the, the universe is allowing you or enabling you to be helpful and useful, even if it's unclear the, the strategy of how that's happening. Right. Um, okay. John, what's the difference between being a psychic and being intuitive? Um, I don't think there's really that big of a difference. I think everybody's intuitive. I think everybody is psychic. Um, I always like to take the word gift out of the equation. And I know it's associated with the field uh, and it's been for like, you know, decades, centuries. I don't even know. But um, I like, let's just get rid of the word gift because the word gift, when somebody goes my gift or, you know, my gifts puts them automatically above the next person. So I feel like, yeah, I've been at this now for four decades, but I have an ability and I've worked at it. If we all go to the gym and we work at it for four decades, people are going to get stronger and they're going to develop muscles, right? They're going to get leaner. They're going to, they're going to look different because they put the time in. So I think, you know, I know that there's some adage that if you put up what, 10,000 hours or, you know, somebody does like for 10,000 hours or somebody's the 15 year overnight success kind of vibe, but that's just it. It's like you put the time and energy in and you can develop. So I think everybody is psychic and that they should learn to listen to their intuition so that they can make more informed decisions. And I think that's where astrology comes in, in the everyday person's way of kind of understanding what's the weather like? Like, like what, how do I dress for this? How do I prepare for this? And more importantly, not to look at it in my chart. Like, so like when I watch you guys, I don't, I don't jump off the elliptical machine, pull up my chart to look and see what degree I have, what you're talking about. I just take in the weather. And I go, okay, so this is what's coming in this week. This is the storm front that's coming in. Oh, this is going to be a two to 200 week. Okay. Like I go from the energy. See, I pay attention. I go from the energy of like, what's, what's coming in. And then I make, I make more broad stroke decisions of like, okay, I'm going to do this this way. And that's without even looking at my chart. Mm -hmm. And then if there's something else that kind of hits me, then I'll look at my chart and be like, okay, let's see if I can figure this puppy out, you know, or let me look at my kids and let me see if I can see what's happening there, you know, there for them. Yeah. I mean, astrology is such a tool to confirm our intuition. I mean, so, so much of the time we can feel these things happening and then the astrology just confirms and says, yes, you, you were, you're on the right track. You knew this was coming. You knew something important. There was something important to pay attention to, et cetera. So I see that going hand in hand too. And the best astrologers are not only good technically, but they also rely a lot on their intuitive skills as well. Now, many years ago when I was working at a video store and I jokingly say for the people that are younger video stores, like Netflix in a building. Um, and one of the things that I, I was there, I was like there in the afternoon, like completely quiet. Nobody was in the store. And this lady walks in and when she walks in, I literally looked at her and I saw superimposed over her, the, the Zodiac astrological wheel. And like I had psychic Tourette's, I just went, Oh my God, you're, you, you're an astrologer. And she stopped first time in the store and she turned around and looked at me. She goes, and clearly you're a psychic. I was like, <laughs> kidding, literally. And her name was, her name was D Weiss. And, um, and then she and I would talk all the time. And I remember saying to her one day, I go, I said, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with this field. I go, can you, um, how many years did it take for you like to like know this? And she was like, what do you mean? I go, how many years did it take for you to like learn? And she goes in this lifetime. Exactly. Like, what? And she's like, I know stuff that I was never taught. I don't know why I know it. So I feel like in this lifetime, I like just added on to that. And then I went to my friend Shelly and I gave her information from D. And I said, well, D says she does old astrology and that what you're doing is like newer astrology. And D gave me information that was very specific. She told me that October, of, she read me in early 1988. And she said that that coming October, 
there was going to be a pivotal moment with my mom, like a crossroads, an intersection, a life change, like a huge, big life transformation in October of 1988. But she also said that she thought that my time of birth was off by a minute. And in her way of doing astrology, it being off a minute would put things off a year in, in, in my life. All her words, right? Um, so October of 1988 comes around. Something did happen with my mom where she helped save somebody on a bus. And then as a result of that, thought she injured her shoulder. Ironically, it's the moment that triggered whatever was happening with her, with her cancer. Anyway, long story short, my mom died the following October in 1989. And when I went to my mom's wake, Dee was there. She came and she literally pinpointed the time my mom passed. And first of all, I kind of thought it was a little bit weird, like, you know, not, I'm so sorry for your loss, but like, you know, you know five to four. I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, five to four. I'm like, yeah. She's like, yeah. She goes, I told you your, your time was off. She's like, I had the wrong October. Oh, wow. When I went back to Shelly. She's like, she got it psychically. And I'm like, she's claiming she's not. And I would never let the two of them meet because mm -hmm. I didn't think they would get along because D did not think of herself as intuitive. She was an interpreter of the science of astrology. It was nothing intuitive about what she was doing. It was just like engineering for her. And Shelly was like, yeah, mm, I don't think so. Mm. I don't know, but she was spot on accurate. I would love to hear from the audience because there's a lot of astrologers in this audience. Is it, would it have been possible for that? Have you heard of that? You know, a, a birth time being off by a minute and that correlating with a year. And if so, what technique is that? Because that's really fascinating. You know? I asked and, and nobody's, nobody said, oh. No, yeah, I want to see if anybody knows in the audience because they might, they're in the chat. So, okay, you have said that we are all intuitive AKA we're all psychic on some level mm -hmm. that we need to work out in the gym, so to speak, in order to bring those skills to make them stronger, right? Yep. Is that also true of being able to speak to those beyond the veil, or speak to those who have transitioned? Can we all do that or do we need a medium? Nobody needs a medium. I think that what's important for people to recognize is that life and love are eternal, energy is energy. Um, a medium gets in the way of what's already there. I think what a medium can do is to confirm, validate, verify, acknowledge, support, and act as a louder conduit. But I think the goal is for us to have our own relationship with spirit and not need a reading. That, I mean, that has been my, my philosophy since I was a kid. Um, you know, to, the, to my grandmother's dismay when she would say stuff like, why do you tell people they don't need you? You're, gonna not, you're not gonna be business. I'm like, it's fine, <laughs> Dude, we're good. But I really believe that. And I think that we have to be 50% of the equation so that they can only be 50% of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, too many people when somebody loses a loved one expect, demand sometimes that the person that's in spirit who just passed now has to like, you know, I don't know, put on like a Broadway musical in spirit for them to know that it's, it's actually, you know, grandma coming through. So as, as long as we're able to recognize information and energy, I think then we could show that there's life and love are eternal. And one of the books I recommend everywhere I possibly can, I, you know, I, I want everybody to read it. It's a book called Hello from Heaven, and it's written by Bill and Judy Guggenheim. There's not a psychic or a medium in the book, and they studied a, a whole bunch of after-death communications. They call them ADCs. But what I like about that book, and I prescribe it for my clients to read all the time, is that when they read it, they have that aha moment that I had when I was sitting on the floor of the library as a kid going... Well, I didn't know that that was psychic. I didn't know that was a thing. So I think that we are so busy looking for the big billboard in the sky message that we miss the subtlety of that lyric that played on the radio or that line in the movie that you've seen 10,000 times, but that day just had a different like ripple in your world or that scent or smell that showed up out of nowhere. That's nobody else's except the person who's passed, right? while always maintaining that healthy balance of being in the balcony, right? To always not make sure that everything's a sign because not every time the light flickers is a grandma. Sometimes the bulb actually needs to be changed. <laughs> John, what would you say blocks us the most from being able to commune and connect with people who have transitioned? Grief. I think grief can block us. I think that we get, um, we get stuck in that moment 
Um, if anybody's a fan of WandaVision, you'll you'll know that there was a, a, a moment in the last series where, or the second to last episode, where one of the characters says, you know, what is grief but the, perse the perse persevering of love? And I've always said that grief is the other side of love. And it's a way of feeling our feelings of love, but not knowing where to place it, not knowing where to put it, having a key without the lock, right? So we recognize we still have the key. We don't need the physical lock because we have the key and the key represents symbolically what it would open up anywhere. So that, that thought form of the lock is equally as powerful as the physical form if we allow ourselves to connect with that. And I think too many people get blocked by, by their grief um, and they don't want to feel what they're, what they're feeling, you know, and like they don't want to feel that heaviness um, uh, and or that, you know, that, that concern of, am I ever going to see them again? Or are they ever going to be a part of my life? Are they going to know that I've got kids? You know, will they, you know, a big one for people that's not always discussed is if somebody moves, right? If mom and dad are buried in New York, but you're moving to Nashville, is that a problem? Because they're buried someplace else. And now I'm residing in a different city, state, or even country, right? People are, are surprised when their loved ones from different countries come in and they go, oh, you can get them? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it's not like a long distance call. Like I have to have like a special service or something. It's like, there's no physicality to, you know, that dimension. So I think the blockage is sometimes is, is our grief. And then reality of knowing what the potential is, which is why I tell people to read Hello from Heaven. Because I think when they get that knowledge, they can have that moment of like, oh, I, I had that. I had that moment. Mm. And what would, what's the thing that opens up that conduit or that channel? I, I'm going to go with knowledge. I think knowledge is really important because it's the foundation that you build on, right? You know, it's like, I like the word foundation, you know, like you have to, you have to have a strong foundation for anything to, 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 to be substantially to last a long time. You know, you look at the ruins in, in Europe, right? They, they might be in ruins, but their foundations are still pretty much intact, right? Like you, you could see what they're built upon and how they were built. Houses today, you know, they, they have to be built on a strong foundation and they, they put rebar inside those foundations to make sure that you can keep everything, you know, strong and sturdy. So I think having a strong foundation in some iteration of belief. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to have a belief in, you know, organized religion, but I think having a belief in the divine, in the divine matrix of how the universe is set up, you know, and I love when you talk about being out on the beach, whether it be at night looking at the stars or in the morning at sunrise, when you talk about that, that, that visual, it makes you feel small because you recognize that you are a grain of sand like the rest of the beach. Like you're just on it. You're on the beach, right? And it's you're part of that, that moment. And if you do the grounding of putting your feet in the water and the sand, you become one with all of that. So I think all, all of that is important from a foundational place to have a feeling of connection to something that's way bigger than all of us. Um, and then it like kind of like lightens the load a little bit. Like I know for me, I don't know if it's because of my, my astrological makeup, but like being by the water, being in nature, you know, maybe it's the Venus Libra thing. I don't know. I, I, I need beauty. I need things to be aesthetically pretty. You know, they used to make fun of me as a kid when I would like have to sit down and like write bills out and pay bills. I would have to make sure my, my room was clean and organized before I actually sat down to write a check. And they'd be like, can you just write the check? And I'd be like, no, no, I gotta, I gotta like set up, I gotta set up, I gotta set a mood. <laughs> it's like, I gotta have that. So. Oh God, John, that's so awesome. Okay, so another question for you. Are, are you getting tired yet? Or are we doing okay? No, whatever you got. So much fun. Thank you. And and the, there's so much love for you in the chat. It's just, uh, it's amazing. Everyone's so happy you're here. What would you say is the most consistent, consistent message that people are wanting to convey from the other side to those of us who are still here? We are okay. You're not. <sighs> Seriously. Wow. Like, yeah. we're, like, we're good you got to work on you. Like, you know, we're, we're good. You got to take care of this. Like, you know, and a lot of times it's like somebody's grieving so, so hard that they're not taking care of their physical health. 
And grief literally will put them in a category where they now become ill. So I think that, that, you know, it's, we're okay. You're not kind of vibe, but really ultimately everything boils down to take the opportunity to communicate, appreciate and validate the people while they're here, say what you need to say, because we don't know how long we're going to be here, you know, and I'm talking from somebody who does this work, you know, like I didn't know that when my uncle passed, my mom was going to be gone almost two years later. I didn't know that, you know, like, did I have inklings about things that made sense after the fact? A hundred percent, but not to the point that I was prepared, you know? So I think that having conversations and communicating about real life things, like there's an, there's an imbalance. Like people talk about babies and they talk about birth and they talk about, you know, cribs and they talk about buying the clothes and all that exciting stuff. Well, guess what? You do that when somebody passes too. It's the same thing. It's like, like flip it over. Right. So when you look at, look at um, birth, you know, you have the energy of this child that's in this warm, secure environment, nurtured and loved. And then there's a tunnel with a light at the end of it. And they're ripped out of that world into a new world where they're met by family members and friends that are waiting for them. And they're only too excited to have them be part of the family. Well, that exact, that exact same phrase could be applied to death too. And we leave this world, right? Beginnings and ends. But we talk about the birth part of it. We talk about all of that, but we don't talk about and prepare people for the end end of life stuff. And I think it's really important to do. I do it all the time with my kids. You know, I make it very, very normal. You know, sometimes my wife would look at me and be like, a little morbid. And I'm like, well, you know, you have both your parents, both are mine are gone. One of them passed at 19. So I have a different experience. So for me, I don't, I jokingly say, I don't come from good stock. You know, one was at 48, one was at 50, like 60. So I was like, I got to make sure that I say everything I need to say. And it's not because I really think I'm going anywhere, but I want to make sure that I planted seeds in their garden that are going to be perennials for the rest of their life to when their grandparents. Mm -hmm. So when their grandparents, they're going to be able to actually, actually get emotional saying it to you. Um, that they're going to be able to give to their grandkids things that I've given to them, that that's our legacy. Like our legacy is love and ex shared experience and values, like all of that. Amanda, you can make me cry now. I'm not like <laughs> helping you. <laughs> Freaking Barbara Walters of astrology over here. <laughs> oh my God. You know you are talking about like planting a sustainable garden, like with our lives, you know, a permaculture garden that is, it, it continues to give and it continue, continues to feed our children, their children. I mean, it's such a beautiful thing to think about. And something else that's amazing, John, is when you say the message that the people on the other side consistently say, like, we're good, you're not, like, it's, we're good here. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. One of the things, Rick, Rick Levine has said is that it's people always go, Oh, well, how do you know if someone's going to die? Is it a Saturn transit? Is it a Pluto transit? You know, these like, Oh, it's going to be, you know, something bad. It's like what they've found is it's mo more likely a Jupiter transit, a Jupiter, like in Jupiter supposed to be expansive and happy and benevolent. It's like, well, maybe that's cause it is right. Well, maybe that's cause it is. And, and if we were able to see it that way, maybe we would have a different relationship with death, but also with life. Like you're saying, what I'm hearing from you is that this understanding enables you to live life that much more fully every single day. hundred percent. Yeah. I, and it's what people will, you know, will sometimes not, not resonate with, remember, you know, I'm not for everybody, um, is that I'm direct and I'm blunt and I, I don't want to, I don't want to like waste time and I don't want to play games and like, you know, like people have expectations of, um, how they think somebody should be. Right. So they think like, if you're an astrologer, if you're a psychic, if you're a medium, you know, you're, you're somewhat like a minister, pastor, priestly in some way, and that you're not a real person, you know? And like, we're real people having real experiences. Oh, and for the next hour, we'll be sharing our ability and knowledge with you, but you're getting like all of that. I remember doing an event here in Long Island. Um, and at the end of the event, it was myself and like two other people. Shelly was one of them. Sylvia Brown was the other. And this man walked over to me. He goes, can I just say, you're amazing. You're, you're just so damn accurate. Thank you so much. 
And I was like, and I didn't read for him. I don't think I read for him that night. And I was like, thank you. I appreciate that. He goes, but can I also just say something else? And I was like, mm, here it comes. And I was like, sure. He goes, you, you talk about your family a lot. Like your, like your loved ones. Yeah, we don't care. And I was like, oh, that's too bad. I said, because I can only teach from experience. I go, and they are my experience. I said, so I could give you theory or I could give you practical application about what I've went through, how I've gotten there, what it means for me, and objectively share my experiences that are highly personal so that you don't have to actually air your dirty laundry out in front of a room full of people. I'm doing it for you. So like, I will reflect an experience. And, but it's also my way of keeping them alive. It's a, it's a way of honoring my grandmother. It's a way of honoring my mom or Shelly, right? So I, I don't treat them like you can't see it, but next to that little glow up ball there, um, I have a, a blue rose. And that blue rose is in honor of Shelly because when she passed, I had a very profound visit from her. And there's a very long story attached to it, but she, um, she gave me the blue rose as a symbol of people who are, are new arrivals. People have just passed. So if I'm now doing a reading and I see a blue rose, I know somebody's passed in the last 18 months, mm -hmm. roughly. Wow. John, this has been so much fun. Can we uh, do it again? Hey, hey listen, anytime. <laughs> All right. My job well, is to teach, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. It's so much fun to hear not only, I, it's, it's amazing to hear about how you have connected with astrology, how you view it, how you value it. And, and that, that just, it's, it's a testimony to everything that you all are studying and learning. It's don't be hard on yourself if you're not getting it right away. It's something that is, is challenging for a lot of people. And it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor though, right? Yes. 100%, 100%. Yes. And let me just say that if somebody stumbles across this on YouTube or you're watching this and this is five years from now, you know, go back and watch all the other stuff that Amanda's put forth and, You've, you've, you're doing an uh, you're doing an amazing service because we're living at a very weird time. I think on the planet, you know, in all of my decades of doing this, this is the this is the period of time that I personally feel this work in this world can really shine a light in some dark corners, not just of like the world, but in people's lives. And I feel like if we could use astrology, if we could use the information that you're providing as that, you know weekly weather, cosmic vibe, understanding, give color, make you make better choices. You don't have to be an astrologer. So like, that's my message for you guys. Like you don't have to be an astrologer. You don't have to have a practice. Don't even strive to go down. I mean, if you want to, that's your path, that's your path. It's going to happen, but go to a place of enriching yourself with the language so that you can communicate with the world that we're living in differently and understand that we have the ability to make choices within that. Mm. And it's something you said earlier, you know, this recognizing that we're connected to something bigger yep. and how we like to do that through nature. That's one of the biggest gifts of astrology, too. It's like, look, there is some energy, intelligence, divinity, whatever you want to call it, that is operating in our lives, whether or not we're aware of it. And so but connecting to it helps us feel like we have that anchor on this planet. And that we can we can use that awareness, like you said, to make better choices. To me, it's like at the end of the day, that's that's it. It's like just use the awareness to make better choices and continue learning, continue doing our best to evolve, which is the, the name of your membership. John, I was writing the word evolve out as part of the assignment that I have for your membership. And I was so delighted to see the word love so prominent in there. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Just an extra E, but it's essentially love. Yep. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your membership and who it's for and what the intention is behind it. So in 2004, when my first TV show crossing over went crossing over, um, I like, okay, I was like, now I'm going back to just like having a normal life again. And I was given a message by my team, my guides that they said evolve. And I was like, yeah, like, okay. <laughs> I like what we're all supposed to be doing. You know, like I'm a little you know, sarcastic even with them, but, um, they gave me this like word to like work with. And I really wasn't, I honestly really wasn't sure what to do with it. And then once I started getting the clearer like vision of part of the plan, but like the clearer idea of what they wanted me to do, which was this like online community. Um, I kind of went down the wrong path first, my choice, not theirs. I own it. 
Um, and I, I did it the wrong way. I did it in a way that diluted everything. You're doing it in the right way. You're, you're making the work first, you know, like the way that I, I did it originally kind of made people the, the stars in a weird way rather than the subject matter. So we learn, right. We evolve. And when I started evolve itself, I made it just me. And it was Evolve with John Edward. And I would then slowly bring in other people, like somewhat like similar to what you're doing, uh, but in different areas, um, whether it be a life coach or a nutritionist, anything that brought on information that would help the community evolve in whatever way that might be. And that community is just based on johnedward.net. It's just on online. And it was it's the it's the reason why I stopped doing my second show. Like I did three seasons of a show called Cross Country, and they wanted to do more. And I said, No, I'm I'm good here. I go, I'm I'm done here. I I, I need to go do something else. And they were like, What do you mean? I go, I, I need to teach. I go, you guys aren't gonna let me teach. You're gonna want me to stand in front of the camera and read for people. And and I appreciate that, but I kind of done that now twice. I need to do something that's gonna raise the awareness. So that's what I did. I left television and I went to to do it online when everybody told me that. Nobody would do it. Nobody would subscribe to things like that. And I was like, we'll see. Because I saw the Netflixes and I saw all of that, you know, from 2008, I think is when I started, 2009, um, when I started on the online journey. And everybody's like, no, no, you got to be free on YouTube. I'm like, nope. I want people to be accountable for why they're there. And if they're paying for it, they're going to show up and they're going to be accountable. Um, and, and that's what we've done. And it's been an amazing journey. I think we're in season 14. Um, and we've got some amazing contributors and the, you know, it's like a, it's like a family, the people they're from all over the world and they're just a, they're an amazing bunch of people. Matter of fact, right next to me is some of you see that, but one oh. of the guys is an, is an artist and, um, he actually sketched some of the members oh. and he put like up here, these two, two of them have passed. So he put them in spirit behind them. But like, it is that, you know what I'm saying? Like we, we, we are that kind of cluster, that family, that tribe. And I think it's important for people to find their tribe. And that's what you're doing. You're, you're literally giving people an opportunity to find their tribe. And, and I think during these divisive times, it's important to find similar vibration. Um, absolutely. And one of the things I'd love seeing is people coming together in shared values, shared, shared, shared love. You know, for us, it's astrology. It's like, there can be so many different political viewpoints, so many different ways that people are interpreting the events of the world, but we all share our love of the sky. We all share our love of astrology. And it, I love John too, how you've created a family in Ohana. It's the same thing we have in our inner circle. We call it the Ohana. And it's, it's, there's something about that, you know, people finding their soul family. So many people don't have the best biological family experience, but to have a soul family experience is, is amazing. So check out John's membership. I'm actually contributing to it this year, which has been, again, so fun. And John's entire team is amazing to work with. It's, it's what I say about our team at Astrology Hub, amazing. Your team feels like family to us, which That's has awesome. been so fun. Thank you. So helpful. So like go out of their way to support us and help us. And it's just incredible to experience. And John, thank you for being such a supporter uh, you've encouraged me in so many ways. You've validated what we're doing in so many ways. And I just really appreciate you as a human being, as you know, someone who has recognized something in what we're doing and just reached out and said, Hey, I want to support you. I want to like, I want to help you. I don't know how, but I want to help you. What do you need? It's like, wow, there's people like that. And that's amazing. That's cool. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. It's meant a lot to me. It really has. It really has meant a lot. So thank you for being here. Thank you for all of you for tuning in, for all of your enthusiasm in the chat. Thank you for the feedback. If you haven't subscribed to our channels yet, go ahead and do that. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, give us a like if you're enjoying the content that helps us get it out to more people. Thank you for being a part of our community. Thank you as always for being, for making astrology a part of your life. John, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Can't wait to have you back. Take care, everybody.